thank you for joining me again today on the Finding Hope After Loss podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. If you like the show, please consider leaving a review or rating on Apple or Spotify. It only takes a moment and really helps the show reach more loss and infertility families. As we recently discussed, Bereaved Mother's Day is on Sunday, May 5th this year. For this date, I am doing a special post that includes all of the names of our babies gone too soon. The reason I like to do things like this is because as lost parents, we rarely get to see the names of our babies, especially from somebody else. And the joy we feel at our baby being acknowledged and recognized, it's just something I can't even describe as a lost mom. Seeing Jasmine's name just means everything to me. If you would like your baby to be included, please see the post on Instagram or Facebook at Journey for Jasmine, or you can send me a message. You can also email me at sarah at journeyforjasmine.com to make sure your baby is included. Today's business spotlight is from Michaela with her organization, Keep Our Littles Ticking. Here is what she had to say. Hi, my name is Michaela Finger, president and founder of Keep Our Littles Ticking Foundation. Keep Our Littles Ticking Foundation was made a month after I lost my son Colt after unforeseen umbilical cord issues. We lost him to stillbirth at 35 weeks and four days. Keep Our Little Sticking was made because I received a care package when I lost Colt with a baby onesie, baby hat, and baby blanket, and comforting items such as books. But I didn't see it just as all comforting because I was wondering why do I need all this stuff for a baby I don't have? So I started care packages for mothers who have lost. And the care packages have comforting items that have helped me through my grieving process. The care packages include weighted stuffed animals with your baby's names on them to help comfort you and help with that empty arm syndrome that I for sure still have. We also have devotionals and books and self-care items in our care packages. Keep Our Little Sticking also has support groups on Facebook and Keep Our Little Sticking Foundation on Facebook. We also have where you can sponsor a care package for a grieving family. You can also donate to Keep Our Little Sticking for care packages at keepourlittlesticking.org. Please check us out on Keep Our Little Sticking Foundation on Facebook or our website. And we thank you so much for listening in. Thank you so much, Michaela, for sharing about your organization with us. Today, I am talking with Monica, who has experienced a lot of loss in her lifetime, including several family members and a pregnancy loss. Monica discusses how she became more in tune with the spiritual world and started seeing signs. She talks about how you can start to see signs from your baby. Hello, everyone. Today, I am here with Monica. Monica, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my name is Monica Morrissey. I'm happy to be here today. And I live in northern Vermont. I um, spent 32 years as a public educator. And then I changed into uh, working in the spiritual world um, based on my father sending me some dimes um, after he passed. And so that's kind of been my journey, um, writing books now about signs of the afterlife and also teaching a lot of Reiki either online or in person. Um, I love people to really get in touch with their energy. So, yeah. That's kind of a, a shift from being a teacher to, to doing the more spiritual work. What, what kind of led you in that direction? Well, when I wrote my first book, it was very scary to, um, I really had never, um, I, when I say spiritual, I mean, I'm not necessarily a religious, although I did um, go to church years ago, but um, I shared my story and I was a little nervous. I was scared. I was fearful, right? Sharing this side of me. And um, when I did, miracles started to happen and the universe sent me so many messages that this is what I was going to do. And so like I'm using my teaching skills now to help others understand this other world. So can you talk a little bit about your lost journey? 
Yeah. So um, when I was a kid, I like to back up a little bit because when somebody died in my family, it was done. Like you didn't even talk about them. Like my grandfather died two weeks before I was born and my family never even like, I don't know much about him. I didn't even know he had polio until after my parents died. And I found out from my uncle, he's mm-hmm. like, well, yeah, my dad had polio. And I'm like, I just never heard even stories about him. And so I kind of grew up sheltered and never went to a funeral until I was 18. And so um, about 2000, it was 2008, all of a sudden, my kids were 12 and 14, I think at the time. And uh, all of a sudden, we got a phone call and my nephew had died in a car crash. And he was 21. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and I didn't know how as a mom to help my kids through it because I wanted them to experience something different, but I didn't know what that difference meant. And someone happened to mention a book to me, uh, Brian Weiss's Many Lives, Many Masters, that gives a totally different perspective on um, souls. And that, you know, he does a lot of past life work and understanding that our souls are only here for a certain amount of time. And so anyway, I tried to help my kids through that. And so I ended up reading these books about signs of the afterlife. And I tried to keep, you know, their cousin alive in a way, like in their hearts and in their legacy and like, be like Tyler was, what did, what did Tyler do that you, you know, want to embrace in your own life? And how, you know, how did he, what did he do that you want to keep alive? And then his number was on his jersey was number eight. So that was always our number. We saw an eight, you know, your bill comes up and it's 888. And so we had a little fun and I started going to see mediums and he actually came through at one of the sessions. Um, And I just started kind of the search like about life, but through the lens of death, if that makes sense. Like, why are we all here? What's really going on? Which I had always kind of questioned before. So I did like a lot of work, a lot of work with my own children. And then it was almost like it was prepping me for losing both of my parents. So I lost both of my parents within eight months of each other. And it was like, wham, wham. And if you're, if you have both of your parents gone, you feel a little bit like an orphan, like, I, there's nobody out there, you know, when you have your parents, you feel like you're um, taken care of in some way, you know, other than other people. And so, um, and so anyway, I was able to apply everything that I had been learning since my nephew died to when my parents died. So, and then um, another thing, I know that this uh, story, that your podcast is about uh, grief of losing children and babies um in between both of my pregnancies I did um lose a baby and years later I had a medium share with me that um it was the same soul that came back so who knows if this is even true or not but she said it was the same soul but um the timing wasn't quite right and so you know right after I lost that baby but that that is such a big Whole that you can you it's hard to describe when you lose a pregnancy but it's this big hole that never goes away you always feel like a little piece of your heart is gone and um I don't know I just felt empty inside because you think that there's going to be this life inside of you and there wasn't and I I really struggled through that so you've definitely had a lot of loss in your life it's been a journey. So when you first went to, for the first time that you went to see a medium, were you, were you skeptical about it or were you um, just open to what they said? You know, I, you know, people are kind of on either side, like, oh, I totally believe, or I don't know if this is true, you know, so kind of what side were you on? Um, So I was definitely a skeptic. I had friends who believed and they were just like, oh, look at that butterfly. That's my mom. And I'm thinking, how can a butterfly be like, it doesn't make sense, right? Like to me. And so I just kept really reading and trying to understand. But I was definitely a skeptic until (laughs) I was in 
um, with Rebecca and Le Cicero, who's actually in the Netflix series, Surviving Death. She's in um, episode four and she's a medium that's down in Connecticut. And I was sitting in the front row and she was doing a presentation to like a hundred people. And she said, a dime a dozen. And I picked up my necklace because my dad gave me this special dime from his coin collection that I always wear, wore around my, around my neck. And so I held the, I kind of held the dime, like, is she talking about this dime? And she comes up to me and she says, is that a effing dime? <laughs> and I was just like, yep. And then she went on and my father came through and everything was so on point. I can't even describe how good Rebecca is. So I think that there are some mediums out there that it just seems like it's exploded over the past couple of years. Um, and you want to make sure that you get to a good one because I did have a bad experience and I shared it actually with Rebecca that night. And I said, well, somebody told me that my parents weren't together in heaven and because they had their own things to work on, which was just like, okay, whatever, you know, like it didn't make sense to me. And Rebecca, um, fixed that for me and said, no, everybody's together in heaven. Everything's about love. No, there's no human problems over there. So it really helped me get clear on, you know, what heaven is and what it looks like and, and how much love that there is for everybody. So did you find that overall experience comforting then? It was, it, it really is. And, um, you know, the dimes and the, all the other things that I found since then, just, um, you know, I think that one of the parts about grief is that it's really about love. And the more we push it down, the more our hearts hurt. And if we could just embrace the love within our hearts and just really feel like they're still here, I think it really just helps us. But some of us are a little scared, right? Because we don't want our hearts to get hurt. And so I just really try to embrace the love that I feel from for those around me. And I didn't have a great relationship with my mom. She was a wonderful woman, but her and I didn't see eye to eye. And now she's so supportive. And when I ask for support, she's right there. And it's just, it's hard sometimes to really feel that love in my heart because she wasn't that way when she was here. Yeah, that makes sense. It's kind of a different relationship, but not one that you can, you know, physically have here with you. Yes, for sure. So were there other things that helped you with your grief? So um, I don't know if you've read David Kessler's book, Finding Meaning. I have not. Um, so that's a really good one. He worked with Kubler-Ross and Kubler-Ross did not mean for the five stages of grief to be for someone who is grieving. Um, it actually meant for someone who's facing their own death. And so I... I like to, and I, and I actually write about this in my book, Once Upon a Dime, Heaven is Talking to Us, Do You Know How to Listen? And in that book, I mention um, two other grief models. And Warden's uh, four tasks are, are to accept the reality of the loss, process your grief and pain, adjust to the world without your loved one, and find a way to maintain a connection to your loved one. I think that that one you know, like not looking at the the traditional five stages of grief, but to look at those finding meaning and also to carry on their legacy. So when I'm trying to make a decision in my life, I kind of say like, oh, what would my dad say right now? Or what would my Grammy, like what would she want me to do? And so by doing that, I'm bringing their love closer to me. And then I, I can ask for a sign specifically about whatever situation, or I can just feel their love inside me. But, you know, continuing on that legacy through me, and then also um, looking for signs, which I just love. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely a believer in signs now. Before I was, you know, kind of a skeptic, like you said, like, okay, it's just a butterfly, or it's just a flower, you know, but now every time I see a butterfly, it makes me think of my daughter. So I've kind of definitely shifted my perspective on that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's a hard one, especially if you've never had anything like happen to you. Like, you know, my first book started out with this dime that I found on the mountain where I always used to call my dad. 
like two weeks after he died. And it was just like such an incredible story that I want to give other people hope that they can get their sign. And that's that's the premise of my third book. I wrote my first two books about my story and understanding how this all works. And it was great. It was my journey. And people were like, my readers were like, well, you know, I'm so happy for you. You've got dimes from heaven and you're all set. You've got this connection with your dad. But how do I do it? And so in my third book, that's what I really give people the tools to understand. And so a lot of times people are in such deep pain, grief, which definitely you got to cry it out. You have to go through that. It's there's nothing, there's no going around that. If you do, you'll, it'll show up later. So I um, give people the tools of how to try to do this themselves, because I do believe that we're all spiritually connected and we don't have to go see a medium. We actually have the tools within us. And so that's what I'm encouraging people to, to do. Do you think that people are able to use those same tools for um, like a a pregnancy loss, like a baby they never actually got to hold and meet? Yes, for sure. Because that's a little soul, right? I, I do a lot of, and people talk a lot about self-care. I talk about soul care. And so your soul was connected to that little soul that is, is not coming to earth, right? Like, so that soul is still to me, energetically present, just like anybody else, just like my dad, who lived for 79 years, that soul represents that love that you had for that person. Yeah, I, I, I love that. You know, I think they're, they're always with us. You know, we we're always going to love them. We're always going to have that, you know, mother, parent, um, child relationship, even if they aren't here with us. So, you know, I, going back to kind of what you said about, you know, striving to keep that connection through you. I think that's what a lot of us try to do when we lose our babies, try to keep their memory alive through the things that we do. Yeah, for sure. And people will give you bad advice <laughs> and just don't listen to them because they, they're they saying it out of a willingness to try to help, Right but they don't understand because they haven't been through it. And, you know, I had a lot of comments like you'll be okay and and different things. And, you know, people, some people did understand because some of them have been through it, but if you haven't been through it, then it's really hard to explain to somebody. I find it, you know, interesting that a lot of the the comments that people make towards um, people who have lost a pregnancy or, you know, an infant, um, are not the same kind of comments you would make to somebody who lost a parent or who to lost a sibling. And I'm like, why is it okay here? But you wouldn't say it here. You know? right. It's kind of like, um, I use this analogy. Some is uh, when uh, new parents are going to name their baby and then they announce the name before the baby is born. And you get all these negative comments like, oh, I don't like that. Oh, I knew a Charlie and he was a jerk, you know, like all this stuff. But if they had the baby sitting right in front of them and said, oh, hey, this is our new baby and his name is Charlie. Nobody would say all those negative things. Right. Mm-hmm. And so like treating that soul as not a soul with energy and love that's not okay. Like they're treating it like it's just a thing. It's not even a, a, you know, a person and, and they wouldn't do that if the baby was right in front of them. That is such a good analogy, really. Like when you look at it, like, cause you're right. Nobody would be like, Oh, that's a stupid name when the baby's like right there in front of you. Right. And to a mom, that little ball of energy, when you find out you're pregnant, it is a real person right? It is, it has energy. It has, so you have so much love to give to that, you know, little soul. And then when it's gone, it's, it, you know, you really feel all everything that you would feel if you lost someone that you, you know, that, you know, it's just, we don't have the personality of the soul yet. We wonder what they would have been like, right? But they're still alive. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've said before that, you know, it's not just the baby we're losing, we're losing, you know, all the plans we had for them, all the dreams we had for them, all, you know, it's, 
as a family member that's always missing. And like you said earlier, it's a piece of you that's always missing too. Yeah, for sure. So what made you decide to start writing books? Um, so I listened to a lot of Brene Brown work um, and I watched her vulnerability and I was just like, oh, I don't share anything about myself. I kept myself pretty guarded. Um, but uh, I did, you know, I shared a little bit about the first dime that I found was on top of a mountain. It took two years later and another dime that I don't want to give away the end of the book to the first book. But it was just like, you know, I took that dot or I took whatever I found and I held it up to my husband and I said, you cannot call me crazy anymore. This is a sign from my father. I know it is. And, you know, my husband and son were both there and it was just such a, it's hard to explain. And I was just like, I want other people who are grieving to feel this. I want them to learn from my story and I'm a born teacher. And so I started writing and um, I was actually in a lot of pain. I was sick and I rolled my eyes and somebody said, um, writing is therapeutic. And I went, that's not going to help me. And I put pen to paper and within a, like a couple of days, uh, my husband said to me, are you writing a book? And I was like, oh, I don't know. I thought I was just writing my cool dime story. And what ended up coming out was just such incredible stuff. And also, I wanted to share, you know, I was I was a teacher for 27 years in the classroom. And I was five years at an at, as an administrator to seven schools, I was up, the, you know, I'd worked my way up in the education system. But I also fought to get there. You know, I fought against suicidal thoughts over the years, I, I fought against, you know, the negativity in my in my head, you know, just this vo- internal voice. And I was like, people need to understand, like, and I've been sober now for 24 years, like, I didn't get here. And like, I don't have the, you know, 100% of my confidence. Now I'm much better because I, I've worked through a lot. But um I just felt like two, you know, kind of two things like people need to see like what I've been through so that they don't put me on a pedestal and they don't think that I have everything together because I I did. I worked through a lot of things. And then also just, um, you know, just sharing this connection, you know, and so I had to work through a lot of fear, which is in my first book, but then I had to come to terms with who I am and accept myself for who I am. And so that happened during that book. I love that you started just writing it for you and then it turned into something, you know, so much bigger. And it's probably something you never expected to be doing, right? No, about 10 years ago, I said, I need to do something different in my life. Like I can, I could kind of taste retirement coming, but I knew I wanted to do something else. And so I just put that energy out to the universe and said, I don't know, like I'm leaning towards doing something else. And then I've just let that, let it kind of fall. I did in actually the first book that I wrote, um, one of my publicists, my marketing agent, she wrote all about this deep grief. And I actually like, was like, turned off. I was like, Oh, people are going to think it's sad as soon as you heard the word grief. Right. And so I've actually really come to terms with like, Oh, I am still grieving. Like, it's not a done deal. I didn't even like when my mom died, I started taking care of my dad. And I'll tell you what, like, I didn't even grieve my mom until all of a sudden we went on vacation. I wasn't taking care of my dad. And I was like, Oh, wait, my mom's gone. (laughs) And so like, I didn't even, you know, it didn't even register in my brain. I was so busy. And so Anyway, I kind of ran from the whole grief conversation. I was just like, no, let's just talk about the fun stuff, the connection that I have in the afterlife. Let's not talk about that sad stuff. And now I'm really coming to terms with, okay, we're all grieving. We're either grieving for people. Sometimes we're grieving like during a divorce or separation, or we might grieve when we leave, you know, when we when we move out of a house and we move to a different house, like there's grief everywhere. And I was so used to stuffing it down. I definitely am guilty of that too. I tried, you know, let's not deal with this part. And then 
um, yeah, it just explodes into like a bigger thing later. And I'm like, oh, I should have just let it out earlier because now I just like exploded all over everything. <laughs> right. Yeah. If you don't, if if you stuff it, it eventually eventually comes out somehow. Sometimes it comes out as anger. I've worked with some mm-hmm. clients who, um, you know, they're going through a breakup and they're just so angry and mad and they just keep talking all this bad stuff about the other person. And I just kind of look at them and say, do you have any grief in there hiding in that anger? And they're like, oh, dang. Yeah, I am sad. Like, and then they find their true feelings to be able to move through those. I think anger is definitely the easier emotion sometimes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a, in my, in my third book, Once Upon a Dime, um, I have a story about that. Like anger was the easiest emotion, right? I also have a grief journal um, that I published. It's on Amazon. If you sign up for my newsletter on my website, uh, monicaalmorrissey.com, you can get it for free as a PDF file. And, um, but you can also get it on Amazon for $9.99 if you want a printed copy. And it's your journey through grief. And I give some, a little bit of background information about my research with grief. I write, I read a lot of books now about grief and um, just, you know, some general guidelines of, you know, what I've learned. And then some writing topics, one to just explore those feelings that you're having. And I have lots of different quotes from different experts in the field. And then I give some writing prompts that will encourage you to be able to connect to your loved ones. And when you write, the universe responds way more than just our thoughts. And so it's a really a place um, to kind of put some of those emotions So you think everybody can benefit from, you know, at least trying to start writing their thoughts down? Yes. So I encourage people to write um, and don't worry about it being messy and don't worry about spelling and all those things, because when you write, you're actually you're sub you're connecting into your subconscious to your really true, authentic inside soul self. And so when you put that pen to paper, something might come out differently than what you thought at the beginning with your brain, right? So I talk about conscious and unconscious um, and your unconscious can speak a little bit better. And so it it just really, you know, that's what I found when I put pen to paper. Like I had no idea that this was going to come out and it took me nine months for my first book to be born. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I am. I actually find writing helpful as well. So I, I wrote you know, after, and some of it is stuff I never shared with anybody. Some of it is stuff I shared, but I found even just writing it down just for me was beneficial. You don't have to share it with anyone. Yep, for sure. And I hold an online writers group on, on uh, Tuesdays at five o'clock Eastern time. And I just encourage people to kind of dig into some soul work um, or do your own project. So I just love to encourage people to write because because I really think that it's a way for us to process. So I know one thing you mentioned is, um, you know, it, it's kind of hard for, you know, someone who's freshly in their grief to look at somebody who's been doing all of the work that you don't see and think, oh, wow, like, you know, they're past it. They've, they've got it all together. And, you know, but in your experience, that's not the case, right? You're still... Yeah, there's no ending to grief. That's what people don't understand. Because if there was an ending to grief, there was an ending to love. And because your love is so strong, that's what's, that's the pain point, right? And so the more that we can actually feel that love inside our heart and allow it to pass through, then that's where it is. And it's going to be you know, I know a lot of people compare it to like ocean waves, right? Like sometimes it just hits you like a big crashing wave. And the more that you can learn to ride those waves, um, you know, the different um, life that you'll create and just, you know, like making simple things like changes. And this happened to me, especially after my nephew died, because I was just like, we're not all guaranteed for tomorrow. Like, You know, when I was young, I thought everybody's just going to kind of live into their 70s, 80s, 90s, whatever, you know, like we all are guaranteed a spot. And I don't think like that anymore. I think, how am I going to make this the best day possible? Because I'm still here. 
I'm still here. And what do they want for me? And so that kind of helps me get through some of those days. But also, you know, when you get a sign, like, you know, that they're right here with you, right? Supporting you. And so allowing that, even if you do get a sign to allow those tears to come, because those tears are just filled with love. We have such a non-crying society, right? Like, don't cry, don't cry. But what if we just allow those tears to come and knew that they were coming from love? Yeah, I think I've, there's that quote that grief is just love with nowhere to go. I've always kind of liked that one. Yes, for sure. So um, is there any other advice that you have for people that are newly going through grief? Um, so I, in my third book, I really explain how to get a sign. And one of the things is if you keep saying, I don't get a sign, <laughs> you are sending that message to the universe. I don't get signs. And so it's just stop saying that to say, I haven't gotten a sign yet because that sends the message to the universe. Like, Oh, maybe I am going to get a sign soon. Um, but also just know that you're, you send out the what, what do you want for a sign? So for instance, you mentioned butterflies earlier, mine's a dime because that's what my dad gave me this necklace. And so I know that that's my sign. Pennies are from my mom. Um, hummingbirds are from my grandma. Like I know all my signs. And so you say the what, but the how and the when is up to the universe. And you just have to be really observant, be really ready for something and just allow it to happen. I have had, I was at a speaking event one time and this woman, she was in deep grief. I could, it could literally feel the energy coming off her body. Like I could feel how, how upset she was and her husband had just died. And I said, just, just, you, he's sending you love. And I, and I did this motion with a heart and I said, I don't know. He just keeps giving me a heart and heart, heart. And she just started bawling. She started crying. And she said, I went to the beach and I kept looking for like a seashell that was like a heart shape. I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. And then I got back to, you know, when she released it and let go of it, she got back to her towel and her friend points and there's a seashell with a heart. So she was trying like a little too hard. And so when we do that, it's out of lack instead of love. And so the more love that you can feel in your heart when you ask for a sign, the better off you're probably going to get it. Do you think that people will recognize the sign like when they get it? Oh, it, if you have been specific. So what I talk about in my book is look at it like a filter. So if you really want to get something and really prove that this, this system works, ask for something like a pink elephant. But it should be something that connected you to that person. So maybe you had a pink elephant when you went over to your grandmother's house then you're going to go look for that pink elephant and really be specific. Don't just say, oh, just send me any sign. It could be a heart or a feather or whatever. No, because then you're not going to believe it. You're just going to be like, oh, well, that heart's been there for so long. And, you know, I had a friend who asked for a sign and she asked for a rainbow trout. And she was over at my house. I was giving her a Reiki session and she's walking out the door and she points to a picture on the wall and she said, what kind of fish is that? And there's a picture of my husband and my two sons and they're fishing. And I said, well, those ones are brown trout, but Brian's holding the, um, the rainbow trout. And she's like, Oh, okay. I got my answer. <laughs> so she was really specific. She didn't say I want a fish. It was, I want a rainbow trout. So be really specific because then when it happens, you're going to be like, oh, 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 like you're going to be totally speechless. Like you can't deny it at that point, right? <laughs> no, well, that's why my dad put the one on the mountain, the dime on the mountain. And then the next one is just a crazy story. And I think that's really great advice because I think, you know, I've heard a lot of people say like, I haven't gotten a sign or I haven't gotten... But I think you're right. They, they're not asking for a specific thing and they're not knowing what it is to look for. Right. Yeah. So 
So I think, yeah, I think that's really good. And I, I love the, you know, being specific. So it's not like, I'll just have a flower. It's give me a, you know, yellow rose or whatever it may be. Exactly. That's the ticket. So you said you have written three books now? Correct. So my first one is called Dimes from Heaven, How Coins and Coincidences Helped Me Discover My Life as an Empath. So when I started writing, um, I was really kind of angry with my mom for a lot of different reasons. And it came out as I was writing that I'm a super sensitive person. And then all of a sudden, the, all these resources about being an empath, and I'm like, oh, this has affected my whole entire life. I can see now why I am who I am. And so I kind of give you the tools of what I've learned about being a sensitive person um, in that book. And then my second book was More Dimes from Heaven, How um, My Journey to Self-Publishing. So I chrono- while I was writing, crazy shit started happening. Sorry for the profanity, but crazy stuff started happening and I kept track of it all. And so that book is if you want to hear more about my writing, like I did not want to write, I hate writing. And so like, this was such a surprise for me. So I, um, anyway, I, I shared all the crazy stuff that went on while I was writing all the support that I really felt that I had from heaven. And I also give you the tools if you want to write your story. And so, um, that's a really good one if you want to write a book. And then people were, again, were asking, like, that's great that you get signs, but how do I do this is the biggest question that I got from readers. And then, so that's my third book, which is Once Upon a Dime, Heaven is Talking to Us, Do You Know How to Listen? When Proof of the Afterlife Activates the Secret Signs from the Universe. And this can be applied to your life, too. So if you want to manifest something, it can be applied to that, too. And then I have the grief journal. I also have a deck of cards that's called Heaven's Messages. And this was actually inspired by a recent um, death in our community. One of my students that I had years ago. And I sat down and I wrote on the cards everything, like what messages would Heaven want you to know? And like things like you're forgiven. Don't, don't stress. Don't have guilt all these kinds of things that we hold onto and we don't even know that we're holding onto them. And so like, um, anyway, it's a deck of cards. It's available. Everything's available on Amazon. My car, my books are all in print Kindle or audio. And it is me reading them. Do you have plans to write any more? Are you, are you done with, with those three? I have always got plans in the works. <laughs> so I'm just not sure. So I'm on a Lyme warrior journey right now, as far as my health goes. And that has been an interesting thing to, you know, kind of fight to be alive and really fight through this journey. And I'm learning so much about the body, about body regulation, about, you know, how to take care of our bodies better so that we can live longer. So I don't know where I'm going next. I'm sure a direction will, will present itself. <laughs> That's what the, has happened. This keeps happening. <laughs> and it sounds like you've also been able to discover a lot about yourself just through the whole writing process. Yeah. So that's why I encourage people to write because you really do get to know yourself and your story can help somebody else. It really can because there are other people out there who have been through similar things. And I, I just know that I put my first book, if I could just help one person, it's worth it. And I don't know how many people are like, I'm your one, I'm your one. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, I've got a lot of ones now. So that's all great. And I feel like sometimes people think, well, my story isn't like worth telling. It's not interesting enough. It's not, it doesn't have as many bad things or, you know, but I think everybody, like you said, is worth sharing because somebody else somewhere has been through something like you have. Yeah. And some people aren't talking about it, right? They don't necessarily share. You know, I had, I was at a big event this past weekend and I just said to a woman, you need to be you, like go to the trainings, but then also be you, because if you're not you, your authentic self, then, you know, you're just being like that other person. And, and they just started crying. They're like, just like, oh my God, that's so powerful. Like in they hadn't really thought about it like that before. So 
think it's just super important to keep sharing. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like you too. I'm like, if I help one person, then I did my job. It, it was worth sharing. <laughs> you got it. So is there anything else that you'd like to share or add? Just know that your loved ones are right there with you. I know that it's hard, um, but just keep hanging in there and reach out for support. If uh, people wanted to find more information about you, uh, where would they go for that? So my website is monicalmorrissey.com. I'm most active in my Facebook group, which is called Dimes from Heaven. So you can go there. That's where you hear most of like what's going on in my business name is Intuitive Wellness. And I use my intuition to help you understand your intuition and to, you know, I, I like to say like, I want to shine my light so that you can shine your, your light. And so um, just really helping people, you know, shine their light inside them. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on today and sharing a little bit about your story and, and what you do to help other people. I think it's amazing what you're doing. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Monica, for sharing your story with us. Signs are something so many of us want to be able to see from our loved ones and our babies. They make us feel a little bit more connected to them. We often don't have much when it comes to our babies. Maybe a few pictures, a few items, maybe just a positive test if we weren't very far along. And because of this, we are always looking for ways that we can feel more connected to them. I know I feel such a sense of peace when I see a sign from Jasmine. Right before her birthday this year, I was feeling incredibly sad as I was thinking about her and writing a social media post for her birthday. At that very moment, a cardinal came and landed right in front of my office window and just stayed there for a little bit. Cardinals are something I feel represent her. I rarely see them lately, so I know 100% it was a sign from her, just when I needed it most. And I really like Monica's advice to pick the sign you want to use and then just be open to receiving it. So often we are so desperate to make a connection that we tend to overthink it. Is this a sign? Is that a sign? Well, maybe it isn't a sign. And then we get disappointed and sad that others say they get signs and we feel we've gotten nothing. I know from experience when you pick the thing you feel represents them, it will come to you. It may not be right away, but it will come. And for me personally, like I said, it just brings me a sense of peace. I hope it will for you too. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. If you like the show, please consider leaving a review or rating on Apple or Spotify. It only takes a moment and really helps the show reach more loss and infertility families. Thank you so much for tuning in and remember, we are all in this together.